So today we're going to be creating a Dropbox clone. If you don't know what Dropbox is, it is a cloud file sharing service. So as you can see on the right here, we have a cloud and there is a file inside of that. To get started, let's look at some of the requirements that a Dropbox clone would have. Looking at the first bullet point, we have users have a desktop client. The desktop client is going to make it so we can have the second bullet point. Second bullet point means that all files in the folder are synced to the cloud. So for example, right, a user has a machine. We're going to designate this box as their machine. And we have a little folder inside of that. And this folder is going to be able to automatically upload to our Dropbox clone service. Next, right, users need to be able to see changes on another computer. So if they uploaded files on this computer to our service, another computer needs to be able to download these files to that computer. Finally, of course, our service cannot be free, right? We need to make money. So a user is going to be able to pay for more storage. By default, users are going to get 10 gigabytes for free. Now that we understand the requirements for the system, all right, let's take a look at some of the assumptions we can make about it. This is a great question to be asking at the start of the interview. An interviewer will typically provide you with some stats like the below. The first bullet point, right, we're noting that there are 100 million users on our service and 1 million of those users are active daily. DAU is daily active users. The second bullet point highlights some averages that we have about different information that a user individually stores. So on average, a user's file is 10 megabytes in size. The average user has 10 files stored on the service. The average user has two clients. So they have one client, for example, that will upload the file and one that, that, will, that will download the file. And then finally, there are 100 edits per day by each user. If you're enjoying this video, we have plenty more awesome data structure algorithm and system design explanations on interviewpen.com. You can ask us any questions you have about any kind of topics surrounding data structures and algorithms and system design. We release two to four videos a week. You can run your code. You can talk to a personalized AI teaching assistant. And yeah, the is pretty great. Anyway, enjoy the video. Moving on to look at a naive service implementation. Right, this is marked as a naive marked as naive as kind of a uh, initial precursor to the problem, right? And I want you as we explain this problem below to look at exactly what why it's naive, right? There are some big glaring issues in it, uh, but take the time to think about that on your own as well. So to start, right, our users will start with the gold user, and the gold user has a one gigabyte file on their machine that they're going to upload. So they're going to send this one gigabyte file over the network to our ingest server. Our ingest server is going to actually process the file that was uploaded and it needs to save it somewhere. So in order to actually save our files, we're going to use something called a binary large object store, where we have it marked here as S3. And that's referencing Amazon S3, which is a off the shelf uh, cloud provided binary large object store. A binary large object is simply just a group of bytes, right? It can be any sort of file and that can be uploaded and and then these binary large objects, also known as blobs, are then hosted at a URL that S3 will provide. So for example, right, I upload a small file to the S3 service, and then I can download that file from s3.com slash like S3 slash, you know, my file name. Now that we have the file actually stored in S3, right, we need to remember that it's actually stored there. So in order to do that, we're going to have a separate database in our service, and this is going to store the file information. We can think of that as being metadata. So the metadata like, what is the file name? What is the file's URL? So for here, we're going to keep it very simple, and we're simply gonna have a mapping in our database between the file's name and the URL, based on a user, right? We want to attach a user to that. Now that the file is uploaded into our database, both the metadata and the blob, we can start to look about how exactly are we going to notify another client. So once the file is uploaded in our database, the NGS service is going to send a notification to our serving service. The serving service is then going to notify another client for the user that this file has updated. So now the client on their machine knows that this file needs to be pulled. So looking below, then this pink client is able to send a a request to our serving service. This serving service is now going to look the file data up in our database, right? As we mentioned, the metadata, and it can see if the file name exists for what the pink client wants to pull. If it exists, it can then use the URL to go download the data from S3, right, our binary large object store. And then it can send that binary large object data, which is our one gigabyte file that the gold user updated. And now the pink client has the one gigabyte file 
that the gold user uploaded above. This is an implementation that works. Everything is working, right? I can upload a file, it's stored in the cloud, right? And then I can download it. So what are some problems that we can observe? Let's first consider the bandwidth usage that we're using here. To upload a file, we're using one gigabyte of bandwidth. And then in order for the user to receive the file, we're using another gigabyte of bandwidth. So overall, that's two gigabytes of bandwidth usage for one edit. If we have one million daily active users, that's uh, right, two million gigabyte of bandwidth usage each day. So of course that is not scalable. As well as this also isn't fault tolerant, right? A network in general, right? The public internet is not very reliable. So what if we start sending this packet and it doesn't make it, right? It, it chops off here. We now have to resend this entire gigabyte file using more than two gigabytes of bandwidth overall because we've used some bandwidth in order to get to that first cutoff point. So to move into a solution on how we would solve this problem, we'll introduce the idea of chunking updates. Chunking updates means that we still have our one gigabyte file. And of course, when we initially upload the file, we're going to have to send one gigabyte of data. There's no other way to get our file to our cloud service, right, right up here, without having that file actually be uploaded to it. So of course, it's going to be an initial upload of one gigabyte of bandwidth usage. However, every single time that we need to do an update, we can send a small update change. So we can essentially say that only a piece of the file has changed. For example, right, I haven't modified this, this bottom content or the top content, but let's imagine I modified something directly in the middle. That middle portion right here can be referred to as a chunk. A chunk is simply just a small piece of data that has changed about the file. Overall, these chunks are A, going to reduce the bandwidth usage from the client, right? That means that we only have to send the updates that we're making about specific sections of the file. So for example, just this middle section, as well as we solve the fault tolerance issue where we had our user sending the data, right? And it got cut off off halfway through. Instead, in this case, right? We only have to send a very small amount of data again, if this thing is chopped off again. Looking at exactly how this would work out in terms of our infrastructure, right, we can see that we have our gold user and they're sending the chunks of their updates as they happen. This is going to our ingest server and our ingest server, just as it did before, is going to save this in our binary large object store, which is Amazon S3. And it's going to save the, data, the metadata in the database but our metadata is going to change. First, we need, a under, we need a mapping between a file itself and all of the chunks that exist in it. So that way when we receive a chunk, we can mark it down as relating to this file. Then we need a file chunk to be referred to as a, U, to a URL because Amazon S3 can serve a blob as a URL only, right? It doesn't store any more data. Then when the user makes their request to the serving service, as we saw before, it's going to go to the database. They're going to look up the file chunks of the file that they would like to download. And then using those file chunks, they're going to get the URL that they need to pull the information from. So then they can go to Amazon S3, the blob store, get the blob and send these blobs as chunks back over the network. Now that we understand how to actually effectively manage our bandwidth usage, let's do some back of the envelope calculations to understand how much data our service is actually going to use. So as copied from the first slide, these, these are the assumptions that we made about our service and figured out with our interviewer, right? The first bullet point was that there's 100 million users and 1 million of them are active every single day. The second was giving us some averages about the user and their usage of the service. So the average file is 10 megabytes in size, right? There's an average of 10 files stored per user. There's an average of two clients per user, right? You can imagine that as being one uploading and one downloading. Then finally, there's an average of 100 edits per day per user. The first thing to consider is if the average file is 10 megabytes, how much metadata are we actually going to store about that file? So looking up here, right, we can kind of get dive into that calculation. So first of all, we're going to need to store the name of the file. The name of the file is simply, right, a string, right, it's a list of characters and each character is one byte. So if let's say the maximum length of a file name is 100 characters, then there, we are using 100 bytes to store that. We'll also need the creation timestamp. So when the, when the file was created, at what time? And just common knowledge, right? The timestamp is typically 13 bytes. Then we will need the edited timestamp. So when did the user last edit this file? And this is also, right, a timestamp and common knowledge that is 13 bytes. There's as well as more information. For example, right, we needed like our chunk data 
And so in general, we can say combined between all of this information, we're going to look at roughly less than or equal to 500 bytes of metadata. Next, we need to look at how much bandwidth usage we're going to use for the 100 edits per user on average per day. Now, in order to do that, we need to understand how big the average edit is. So let's imagine that a chunk was one megabyte. If a chunk was one megabyte, one megabyte is roughly 500 pages of natural language text, right? If let's just say English text. So that means that let's say we wanted our chunk to be a single page of text, right? Not 500. And if that is true, then we're looking at two kilobytes max on a, a chunk size. Using all of this information, let's look at some results on some back of the envelope calculations. First up, let's look at how much data we're actually going to store in Amazon S3 or our blob store, right? What are we gonna spend on file storage? As we mentioned before, there's 100 million users on our service and the average file is 10 megabytes in size and on average a user has 10 files stored. Overall, that leads us to have 10 petabytes of file storage. Next up, let's look up how much uh, data we're going to use in order to store metadata, right? There are 100 million users on our platform. And as we mentioned before, up here, there we have around uh, 500 bytes maximum spent roughly on our metadata. There are 10 files per user, and that gives us to, that makes us storing about 500 gigabytes in metadata. Then let's get into some bandwidth understanding. First, let's look at the upload bandwidth. There is, a, there is 1 million daily active users on the platform, and each one of them makes 100 edits per day. As we mentioned here, right, we have our two kilobytes max for a chunk size. So we will multiply that by two kilobytes and get 200 gigabytes of daily upload bandwidth. Now, as we mentioned, there are two clients, right? So that means that the first client, right? Client number one is going to upload information and all of those upload clients are going to spend 200 gigabytes of upload bandwidth. But we have client number two and let's imagine that we need to download for client number two. That means that we're also going to spend 200 gigabytes daily on actually updating the file on the client number two. Overall, right, there's some other numbers you're absolutely able to work out here and they're very useful in designing the system. So I invite you, right, to pause the video and think about what are other calculations we can make and discuss in an interview regarding this problem. Now you'll notice, right, going back to the first bullet point that we're spending 10 petabytes uh, on file storage, right? So of course that means we need to actually make money on our service. So let's move on into how exactly we're going to handle the subscriptions for the service. So imagine our original flow, right? We have the gold user, they're uploading their chun our chunks. Our chunks were two kilobytes, so two KB. This is going to go to our ingest server. Now, in order for our ingest server to actually check, right, whether a user has enough storage capacity in their, for example, subscription plan, we're going to have to check the storage usage. So let's say that every single time a user uploads a chunk, we can simply update the database with the file size. So this means that we'll send the blob information to S3 and then right, using S3, the S3 API will know the size of this blob. And then we can update our database, right, our metadata database over here to be able to contain how much data is actually used by the gold user. We also can identify that we only really need to check if a user has used too much storage when new chunks are added. If we're simply replace, if this chunk over here is simply replacing a chunk that already exists in our database, this means that we aren't actually taking up more storage than we had before. If a new chunk is added, then we can check it, right, if the user is using too much storage. And if they are, we'll mark the user in our database as their storage being full. Then anytime we receive any subsequent requests, let's imagine that this gold chunk was the last chunk that was able to be uploaded fitting into the user's subscription. So this red chunk over here is the full one. Now, since they were already marked as being full, that means our ingest can immediately reject it. Now let's look at exactly how many database IO operations we're going to use per second. IO operations is typically understood right, as IOPS for short. So first of all, let's understand how many IOPS we're going to use in order to update the database with the file size on write. There are a million daily active users on our service and each, each user is going to upload a hundred different updates or chunks. There are 86,400 seconds in a single day. So that leaves us with roughly 115,000 IO operations per second. Now looking at the second bullet point, we only need to check uh, when new chunks are added. So let's say in the worst case that every chunk is every chunk that's added 
is a new chunk. In that case, right, we again have a million users on our platform and there are going to be 100 new chunks per day. So we can use the same number as before and get 115,000 IO operations per second if we're going to do this in the worst case. Overall, that leads us to have 250,000 IOPS for subscription management. And let's take a look at how much bandwidth we're actually going to use for all of these IOPS. Now let's imagine that this first bullet point, right, how much data are we actually going to need to send to the database? This is just going to be the size of a chunk. And the size of the chunk we can say at maximum will be a long. A long is eight bytes. We can also say that marking a user as full, this is represented as a Boolean in our database. And a Boolean, of course, does not need to be stored in eight bytes. But let's say worst case, it is eight bytes. Overall, this means that we're going to end up with a bandwidth usage of two megabytes per second. Now that we've considered the actual IO operations for subscription management and how we're gonna handle that, let's take a look at our actual database scale. So how are we going to scale our database? And what are the numbers associated with that? Let's take a deep dive kind of into actually how much data we're going to use in order to manage files. Files, as we can remember, most of the data is stored in S3. That's where our 10, 10, 10 petabytes of data is going to be stored. But the rest of the data is metadata. In terms of writes, there are a million daily active users on our service, and there are 100 updates. So this means that we're going to make 10 billion writes per day to our database. As we mentioned in the back of the envelope slides, we can remember that there was a 500 byte worst case for the uh, amount of metadata for a single file. Moving on to the second bullet point, we can remember that every single user had two individual clients, right? One upload machine and one download machine. That means that for the download machines, there's a million active users and there are 100 chunks to be downloaded each day. So we can say that the worst case for this is that there's going to be 10 billion reads as well. Let's imagine that for every single read, we're going to have to read all of the metadata in the worst case. So that leaves us with 500 bytes in the worst case. Overall, this leaves us with another 250,000 IO operations for file management. And looking at the bandwidth usage, that's 125 megabytes per second. Copied from the previous slide, right, our subscription management, that was 250 IO operations as well, but was only two megabytes per second in bandwidth. Adding these numbers together, we can say that at scale, we're looking at roughly 500,000 IO operations per second with 130 megabytes per second. That means we're just roughly barely going over gigabit speeds. This includes our metadata as well as our subscription data. Moving on, let's take a look at our options for how exactly we want to scale our database because if we get some stats off the top of our head, NVMe SSD has around 250,000 IO operations per second all the way up to a million IO operations per second. So that means we're all right, right on our service where we're roughly in the middle there. Um, but we definitely need to have some sort of replication in general. So to look at our options for our database, right, we have our read replicas as our kind of default option for scaling. Read replicas are great because they're going to fix our read issue, right? We can actually scale our reads across our read replicas. But the problem is, is that we aren't helping solve our 10 billion write issue. Next up, people would typically go to master master replication. So have multiple databases that are in sync that both handle re reads and writes. Overall though, that, that can mean a lot of complexity in terms of management, and that means that there is manual management in order to set up more master replicas, and this beca becomes more and more complex and typically has higher latency over time. So the default kind of scalable system to go for after read replicas is to go to sharding. Sharding is great because we're going to be able to horizontally scale by simply adding shards to our cluster. Right, so let's say we started with two and we can add three or four more later on as we gain more traction to our service. Of course, sharding is still more complex, but in general, we're going for a more scalable solution that will require fewer changes down the line. Now that we understand the scale of all of our operations, let's move on and look at a high level diagram of exactly how our service is going to work. Now, of course, this whole thing is quite colorful and it has a lot of information in it, but we'll go through it step by step. So to start, we have our user up here and they are uploading something. So they are uploading a chunk. Our chunks are initially going to go into a queue. And the reason that is, is because our ingest, which is horizontally scaled as designated by these three dots, our ingest may not be able to handle an influx of chunk uploads, right? if lots of people are uploading once. So in order to handle that load, we're gonna place a queue in front of that so that way by default, right, we can just have 
you know, maybe a few things in this queue and they're just going to be pulled through as normal. And you really don't you know, add that much latency to your requests. But we're, when we're in a heavy, heavy load scenario, lots of people are uploading, this queue really helps us out. Now getting into what exactly happens when a chunk makes it to an ingest server. The ingest server first has to check the storage, right? As we mentioned, we need to actually make money on our service. So we're first gonna go to our subscription manager. And our subscription manager is going to make its way down to our database. And using the database, it's going to be able to check, you know, for example, if the user has paid, if they have paid, right, how much storage are they actually able to use? And are they going over that limit by uploading the chunk in this ingest server? If we're all good over here, then the ingest server understands that it can move on. The ingest server is first going to upload the binary large object to Amazon S3. And now it has a URL that represents this blob. So this is going to go back to the ingest server and using that URL among the other data that it understands about the chunk, it can put this into our database in our metadata table. Okay, so now we have the majority of file upload done, but we haven't actually notified new clients about these file updates. So, right, as I mentioned, right, we have our client number one handled here, but client number two still needs to understand that they need to download. So we're going to send a message and place it in a queue. These messages are simply going to state that a file has been updated. This is going to go to a notifier service. This notifier service is, of course, horizontally scaled in order to handle an influx and load, but we still have this queue in place in case right we have an extremely high influx. This notifier handles the logic to be able to identify and send information to a single user that a file has updated that they can download. Now that a client over here understands that they're able to download a file, they can send a file or chunk download request. This is going to go to our serving service. And our serving service is first going to have to go to our metadata database. This metadata database, they're gonna be able to look up the URL that's going to be in the S3 bucket to represent the blob of that chunk. It's going to send a request to S3, right, get the blob, and use this blob in the serving service to send a chunk back to the client. Now the client has access to the chunk and they're able to replace that part of the file as needed on their machine. Overall, right, we have everything working, but we still need to handle how does a user when they run out of space, so for example, I upload a file, but it gets denied, how exactly do I, uh, how exactly do I pay for more storage space? So we have the ability for a user to go to our subscription manager service and here they're able to send, you know, enter their credit card information and this will be saved in the database that they have paid for extra storage, for example, their monthly fee. Overall, right, this is a great high level diagram exactly how the service would work. There are some smaller details that need to be discussed, but I think the most glaring one is we mentioned that this database was sharded, right? We can see that it's horizontally scaled here, right? We have a shard one all the way to shard n. So let's review exactly what is needed in a shard key. Right, a shard key needs to have high cardinality, it needs to have a low frequency, and it needs to fit our query patterns very well. Looking at those constraints, if we take a look at our metadata table, we can pretty easily see that we're going to need a combination of user and file ID. Now let's consider if we just did each one of these independently. If we just did the user uh, key, this means that we would distribute the users across our shards, but what if one user has more files than another? So for example, this shard is very much stacked up with a lot of files versus this one only has a few. As well as if we distribute by file ID, if we ever wanna look up files by user, right, we can be doing a scatter gather request and going to all of our partitions which is not helpful. In general, most of our clients are gonna be signed in with the same account, right? So this user is going to upload, but they are on, for example, the Bob user account. And this user is going to be, this client is going to be downloading something, but they are also signed into the Bob account to be accessing the same files. We don't have any file sharing between accounts right now. So this means that we need to be able to look up files very easily in terms of a user as well. So overall, this means that a combination of the two is great because it supports our query patterns very well as well. Because for example, if I wanna download my file for the first time, I'll send a file request to download, and then I can go to the metadata database and look up all of the blobs that I need to download and they will be grouped together. Then we can go to S3 all at once and stream this information back through the serving service back to the client. Now we also need to consider our user data. For our user data, the most obvious shard key is user, 
right? There is no real reason to place user data uh, scattered across a bunch of nodes, right? If we need to look up information about the user, it's good to keep them all on one node. So overall, that will be our shard key. Okay, so to get into wrapping up on this problem, there are some further considerations that you can make in the high level diagram we just saw and in general, the, the design. First of all, how exactly are, go are we going to be able to orchestrate the service? So as we mentioned, right, there's a lot of horizontal scaling in our service. So how exactly is that going to be orchestrated, right? How are we going to spawn uh, new instances? How are we going to destroy them? And how are we going to manage load in general? Next, how are we going to do connection management for each of the clients, right? We said that, right, for example, the notification service was able to send a uh, send you know, notification to the client and this client would be able to be updated. But this means that we need some sort of bi-directional relationship. It isn't, right, we can't just do this between standard HTTP because there's no way for our server-side service to get information over to our client. So there needs to be some sort of connection management in our service to handle that. Next up, how is the desktop client design? Right, we mentioned that we would just for example, send a chunk back to a client, but how exactly is the client going to be able to replace that chunk on their machine? Or, for example, how is a client going to understand to break up these files into chunks? That is all part of the desktop client design and can be another element of this interview. Next, in general, right, we only considered a few failure cases, but there are always tons of failure cases in terms of things, you know, randomly shutting down, um, right, what if there's, uh, like, major issues with our platform, right? What if S3 goes down, right? We are depending on an external service. So all kinds of things like that. How exactly would you handle those failure scenarios in your implementation? Finally, there are tons of examples of different considerations that need to be made about this service, right? But they're all what I would say implementation details. So, right, the high level diagram as well as the other uh, implementation details we made around subscriptions and the chunking are very useful. And I think that those are very uh, you know, integral details to the problem, but there are additional uh, implementation details that are able to be worked out uh, in addition to the ones up here. So to look at overall what we achieved in this video, we first looked at a very naive solution and then moved into chunking. That way we could minimize our bandwidth, right? Which is, I would say, a very, very essential understanding about this problem and a uh, major integral part of what an interviewer would be looking for in asking this question. Next, we actually crunched some back of the envelope numbers and that was helpful for us to understand, you know, do we need to scale our database horizontally, right? Which we did. And that was the best solution for us, right? How exactly are we going to implement scale in that? And it honestly got us to understand that we even needed to do orchestration or connection management for that matter, right? In general, this made us understand that we needed a scalable service and there are tons of numbers uh, and opportunities in this section that you're able to you know, do as exercises on your own. Then since we were using so much data with those numbers we crunched, we looked at actually managing the money, right? We need to actually handle subscriptions for our service so that way our service can make money and not just store files for free and how we can actually implement that as part of the ingest service, right? Going over to our subscription service, which can then check the database and ensure, right, that everything that the user is paying for it is able to be satisfied. Finally, we looked at the high level design and that was very useful in understanding the exact, the exact flow, right? For example, how a user was able to upload something to our service, how we used a queue there, for example, and things like that. Overall though, I invite you to look back through the video and especially do these further considerations as exercises, you know, on your own to be able to better understand the service. But overall, I hope this gives you a great start in understanding how to implement uh, a Dropbox clone in a system design interview um, and can help you prepare. If you enjoyed that video, you can get a lot more content just like this on interviewpen.com. We publish two to four videos a week. Really, it's just an arbitrary number. It's whenever I can sit down and do a video because these videos take a whole day to do. And we're always online to answer any questions you may have. Join our Discord, join our newsletter, The Blueprint, where you can get more weekly data structure and algorithm and system design kind of topics. And subscribe and like this video if you actually like this video and it helped you. And also tell a friend that we exist. That's all.